Good evening, family. Welcome this evening to Bible Way Community Baptist Church, the place where Jesus Christ is still the Lord of all and the Word of God still transformed lives. We are excited and delighted that you've tuned in this evening to be a part of our Wednesday night broadcast. We hope and pray that you've been having a real good day and a real good week and pray that things are going well with you and your family in your neck of the woods. Tonight we have a good study, a good study for you. And so share these studies, ladies and gentlemen, share these studies with your friends, with your neighbors, with your co-worker, with your co-workers, yeah. Your co-workers, they need these Bible lessons. We're learning a lot. We're learning a lot. I know you're learning a lot because I'm, I'm learning a lot as I study in preparation to bring you another lesson uh, from uh, the Lord. And so share these studies and, and listen. I know a lot of you, you want the, the notes and outlines and things like that, but you can go on uh, Facebook and YouTube. We leave them out there. And so you can have your own private time where you go back and you take your notes and what have you. All right. Uh, hopefully, you know, we'll uh, get back to doing some in-person Bible study where we'll have both, where we'll have both in person as well as online. But, uh, uh, you know, the Lord is using this online. We're reaching people that we could never have reached before. And so we are uh, having not only a national ministry, but now it's an international ministry. We are, uh, reaching people all over the world. And so we are thankful to Almighty God for the opportunity that he has given uh, to us. And we do want to encourage all of you and invite all of you to come to our Sunday morning worship service. And uh, if you've never been, you're, uh, you're in for a treat. And if you are a member and uh, you're not uh, sickly or elderly or anything like that. You know, if you're in your 20s and 30s and you just sitting at home, you know, in your pajamas on Sunday morning, you know, watching, no, no, you come on, you come on. Uh, uh, this broadcast, particularly on Sundays, is designed for our sick and uh, shed in and our elderly and uh, uh, keep our elderly in prayer. Please keep our elderly members in prayer, our sick and our shed in members. Keep them in prayer. Keep them in prayer. A lot of the elderly, you haven't seen them return because a lot of them have various different sicknesses. Some is even like Sister Clark. She's in a nursing home. And so we want to uh, keep those members lifted up in our prayer. Uh, well, let's go to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we do thank you and do praise you for who you are, the God who hears and you still answer prayers. Lord, we are mindful of uh, some of our uh, senior citizens and some of our um, sick and shed in. We pray that you would touch their bodies and heal their bodies, and we pray that you will even send uh, uh, some members and friends by to let them know that they are not forgotten, and they are certainly loved. And so we thank you, dear God. Now, Lord, we pray for this Bible lesson. Uh, take this lesson and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right. Uh, Let's get right on into our lesson because I got a lot on the wagon. Um, we're still dealing with God, still dealing with God. Lesson 16, does the animal world teach us that there is a God? Does the animal world 
teach us that there is a God. Uh, we looked the last time at the bird world. Uh, we want to look at and the fish world, but today we want to look at the animal world. We want to look at the animal world and see, do the animal world teach us that there is a God? Uh, by way of introduction, you know, there used to be a lady. Uh, well, she's still living, uh, but there used to be a song. I don't hear it sung much today. It, it was a popular uh, gospel song uh, by a young lady. I believe it was just Erica. It may have been her sister to helping us sing. But uh, Erica Campbell, she had a song out about, I love God. And it was uh, uh, L-U-H. It was, I love God. Do you love God? And then she said, what's wrong with you? I love God. You don't love God? What's wrong with you? And, and that's what she, you know, she would be saying. I love God. You don't love God? Then what's wrong with you? Something is wrong with you if you don't love God. That's what she was saying. But uh, our world got things twisted, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, they'll go with something like, uh, I hate God. You don't hate God? Then what's wrong with you? I hate God. You don't hate God? Then what's wrong with you? Something wrong with you if you don't hate God. See, now, they don't just come on out and say those words, but their actions show you that they hate God by trying to eliminate God from society. So they hate God, and then when you don't come along and run with them, they say, you don't hate God? Then what's wrong with you? Something wrong with you if you don't hate God, if you don't think like they think, or they may say it this way, I don't believe in God. What? You don't believe in God? Then what's wrong with you? Uh, I don't believe in God. Uh, you don't believe in God? Then what's wrong with you? Something wrong with you if you go around believing in God. Oh, man, something, something really, really wrong with you. And this is what happens, ladies and gentlemen, in society. Society, ladies and gentlemen, is trying its best to make us hate God and don't believe in God. And when you say, I believe in God, they say, you believe in God? And then what's wrong with me? Something wrong with you. Something wrong with you. Because in their mind, they look at God as just as a fairy tale, like a Santa Claus or something like that. And uh, they say, you know, uh, that's just make-believe. That's a myth that there is no such thing as God and stuff. And so when you don't get in line with that kind of thinking, then they make you think that you are crazy. But see, the Bible warns us against that over there in uh, Romans chapter 12. Over there in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, out of Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2, and this is uh, part of my introduction in my lesson. This is not the main lesson. But uh, uh, Romans chapter 12, 1 and 2 says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service, and be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind. And notice, let me say that again. And be not conformed. That word conform basically is saying don't let this world shape you. 
and make you into their mold. If you believe in God, then that's a good thing. That's a good thing. Nothing wrong with you. It's something wrong with you if you don't believe in God. And, and this is why we need lessons like this here. This is, this is the reason for this lesson. See, they're trying to eliminate God. And one of the ways they eliminate God is Genesis chapter 1. And they try to make it look like that God don't exist. But Genesis chapter 1, we've been breaking it down uh, uh, week by week, looking at uh, each day of creation. And we've made it now to the last day of creation that's dealing with the animals. And so the first question that we need to ask is who made the animals? Who made the animals? Who made these animals? Who made them? Who made them? Well, according to Genesis chapter 1, verse number 24 and 25, God did. Look what it says. And God said, let the earth bring forth living creatures after its kind, cattle and creeping things and beasts of the earth after their kind. And it was so. And God made the beast of the earth after this kind, the cattle after their kind, everything that creep upon the earth after his kind. And God saw that it was good. So uh, we see the scriptures tells us that God created all these things. Uh, all these living creatures, the cattle, the creeping things, the beasts, the earth, he made them all after their kind. Everything that creep upon this earth, everything that's got four legs, uh, um, everything that's got two legs, uh, everything that's got many legs. You know, we used to see these little bugs. They'd call them a thousand legs, but I never sat there and counted all the legs. But they, they call them a thousand legs. But I don't care how many legs you got. Uh, God says, I did it. I did it. Now, God's greatness, excuse me, uh, is seen in the abundance of animals and creeping things. That shows you just how great God is in the abundance of the creeping thing. See, scientists tells us there is estimated, now this is an estimate, eight million different kinds of animal species. Uh, now, some scientists says, or it could be up to a hundred million different species. So, in all actuality, ladies and gentlemen, they really don't know. It's too many of them for them to count them all. They, so that lets you know that God is a God of abundance. He made all these creeping things and uh, animals and stuff. And it's so many they can't count them all, ladies and gentlemen. Also, God's greatness is seen in God's design. Uh, question. How does a, you know, they used to ask this question, so I'm going to ask you because you're some of the smartest mind. I know I'm talking to some of the smartest minds on God's green earth. Listen, how does a brown cow eat green grass and produce white milk? <laughs> now tell me, tell, tell me how in the world. <laughs> A brown cow, <laughs> he can even be black. You can take a black cow that eat green grass and produce white milk. That's the genius of God. Now, one of the secrets, though, ladies and gentlemen, is in a cow's stomach. 
uh, a cow has four compartments. A lot of scientists, they say it's four stomachs. I'm going to say it's, it's one stomach and broken up into <laughs> four parts. Uh, but and every part has a particular function. Cause what a cow does, a cow just uh, throws stuff in his mouth and swallow it, and it goes into one stomach. Then the cow get it out. Of, so it's like a storage, and then he get it out of that, and then he'll chew it. Uh, you know, when he get time or when he go lay down, you know, but while he's eating, he just, he just swallows stuff. No, 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 no. He just, is, is, he just swallowed and, and go into a storage tank and then he'll bring it up and he'll chew it. And then he'll, he'll put it in another stomach and it, then, then it'll, it'll, it'll go through some kind of process and then it'll go from that stomach to the other stomach and then it'll go through a, another process and then it'll go uh, to the uh, final stomach that fourth stomach and then it'll get out into the blood stream and then they once it get into the blood stream and what have you then it'll change over and then eventually it, it, it'll produce that white milk but it's an amazing thing. Who would have ever thought that a cow have, you know, four compartments or four stomachs, as, as some, <laughs> some people say, uh, some scientist says. So that's an amazing thing. Only God could have came up with something like that, ladies and gentlemen. And so who made the animals? God. God made the animals. And then everything have a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Everything has a purpose. Uh, for instance, we were talking about the cow. The cow has a purpose. Uh, for what is some of the purpose? Well, number one, food. I mean, y'all like steak. Yeah, you love your steaks and stuff, and you like your ribs and stuff like that. Uh, you get all of that from the cow. Yeah, yeah. And so uh, uh, you got your um, uh, uh, food, and then you got your milk. You get your milk from the cow. You get your hide from the cow, the hide for clothing and the leather. All of that that we get out and make our belts and stuff with, all of that come from the cow. And then they use oxen, you know, an oxen is part of the cow family. And so uh, use cows to plow with, the ox to plow with, to work with. Uh, also, uh, one of the big things they use cows for is uh, the cow dung, you know, the the cow waste, the manure, uh, they use that for fertilizer. If you really want to, uh, you know, have some good flowers, a good garden and things like that, uh, they use uh, that cow manure uh, for fertilizer and also for fuel. So, and I could go on and on and on because uh, of the use of the cow. So when God put the cow here, it was a real blessing. And same thing about the donkey. The donkey is used for hauling. Uh, you know, he's more like a, a pack uh, animal. They uh, put a lot of, uh, uh, today, you know, we have pickup trucks, but back in the Bible, uh, it was the donkey. The donkey was like your pickup truck. He could, he could haul stuff for you. And then transportation and what have you. And so that was the donkey. And keep in mind, uh, up until about the 20th century, that's what you had, was the donkey. For almost 20 uh, centuries, ladies and gentlemen, you had the donkey. For almost uh, 5,000, 6,000 years, uh, the donkey, the donkey. Uh, also, you got the sheep. The sheep is good for clothing and milk and food. And so everything has a purpose. 
God even have a cleaning crew. Do you know God has a cleaning crew? Uh, God knew that we was going to be people of waste and leave leftovers and stuff. And this is why God has little bitty crawling creatures like the ant. The ant and it is part of the daytime uh, cleaning crew. Uh, you got your bugs and your flies, all of them, the termites, uh, that's part of God's cleaning crew and stuff. Um, uh, Cause your yeah, ant, a lot of time we leave crumbs out and leftovers. So little things, little, uh, little stuff that we leave out. Uh, God said, let me, let me make uh, a, a, a lit daytime. And most of the time, these are daytime. A cleaning crew, even the hogs, the hogs, the hogs. God said, uh, uh, the hog eat your leftover waste and stuff. Uh, eat your slop. That's the hog. Same thing. You can you can throw a part of your hamburger out there, and then the, God said, let me uh, have a dog. And so you got your dog a lot of time. That's right there in your house eating the crumbs that fall from your table, uh, uh, a leftover Big Mac or something, that dog will take care of that. <laughs> He'll take care of that and you got a bunch of stuff and you just put it in, in, in a bucket and take it out there to the hog pen and the hog will take care of it. So these are cleaning. God was thinking about uh, uh, cleaning crew. Then God's got your nighttime. I call it your God's nighttime cleaning crews. Uh, this is your rats and your roaches for the most part. They'll come in your house at night, uh, two and three o'clock in the morning when everybody's asleep. A rat will come in there and whatever you done left out, the rats say, okay, they left this out for me and that rat go ahead and eat that bread and uh, whatever you, done, you got left out. That rat say, I take care of that. Roaches uh, take care of that. Uh, little crawling uh, crickets and what have you. They say, I take care of that. And for the most part, that's indoor stuff. That's indoor stuff. That's indoor stuff. And, you know, they, they'll, they'll stay in the walls and they'll stay in the attic. Uh, at night, I mean in the day, but then at nighttime they'll come down and clean up. And then they often, uh, God's got an outside cleaning crew where he got like possums and armadillos and skunks and raccoons and stuff. And a lot of people say, man, man, what's that old skunk doing around here? What's the armadillo doing around? What's the possum? They're part of God's cleaning crew. <laughs> they out there cleaning stuff. They they getting stuff that we done left out there during the night and stuff like that. Uh, uh, our garbage disposer broke there at the house, and so uh, I was just throwing some stuff out there in the backyard. Uh, since the garbage disposer didn't work, I just took it out there. And, uh, and and pouring the, the you know a, a half a bucket of coin you know that we didn't eat some peas that we didn't eat I was just pouring it out there and I noticed that uh, uh, it was gone but I said now we ain't got no stray dogs so what's happening because I was going you know put some grass with it and make me like a lit compost or something like that but it would be gone overnight it was gone overnight and so early one morning I got up it was still kind of dark and I looked out there in the backyard and it was a possum I said now ain't that something that's what's happening that possum that possum is showing up I was I was really feeding the possum and didn't know it. And so my wife got on me. She said, you better quit taking that stuff back there in that backyard and pouring it out like that. Because uh, you're going to end up having possum and raccoons, <laughs> everything else out there in that backyard. All right. So God has a nighttime. So when God was creating this world, you think about it. God 
uh, we learned last week about how God used buzzards and stuff for road kills and stuff. You know, a lot of times we done ran over a dog out there in the middle of the road where the car just keep on going. But that buzzard will come and that buzzard will come on and he'll eat up that dog that we done ran. So he'll, he'll eat the road kill and, and, and even possum and stuff. They'll run out there and... Uh, uh, eat the road kill. Sometimes the possum end up getting killed too, though, <laughs> because because he moved too slow uh, from the car. He's out there trying to eat that dog up. Uh, so most of the time, the possum just stays in the yard. He he he, he tried to stay away from that road because a lot of times he don't move out the way fast enough. But God's got you know raccoons. He got wolves. He got foxes. He's got. Uh, 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 coyotes, he got cougars, he got, you know, so big cats and things like that. All of that is part of God's cleaning crew. Yeah, yeah, uh-huh. And so God has purpose in mind. And, and, and these are other things that God used him for, but I, uh, I know, you know, just as a fact, that uh, God used those things as cleaning crews. But, but most of the time, whenever God had something in mind, it's more than just one thing. Yeah, uh, God gives wisdom uh, to little creatures. He gives wisdom to little creatures. Look at what the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 30, verses 24 through 28. It says, there be four things which are little upon the earth, but they are exceedingly wise. The ants are a people not strong, yet they prepare their meat in the summer. The coney are but a feeble folk, yet make their, their houses in rocks. The locusts have no king, yet go they forth all them by bands. The spider take hold with her hands and is in king palaces. Now you think about this. You think about what God said. God gave, now these are little bitty things that you almost have to hunt to see. Uh, the ant works in good time and prepares their food for hard time. See, you don't hardly see no ant out uh, in the winter months. Why is that? They don't have to go to work because they worked hard all in summer long and then they stored that food. They put that food way down there in the cellar. I call it down in the cellar, underground, underground. See, you see them above ground during summertime and springtime and after rain and stuff. You see them above the ground. But in the wintertime, you, they underground. They underground. When hard time come, they underground and they got enough food to last them the rest of the winter. And so that's wisdom. The Bible said God gave them that that wisdom. And then the coney, the coney is really, you know, we would call them a, a rock badger today. They lives in rocks or hard places. And the reason they do that. It's to kind of stay away from the coyote and stuff like that. The predators can't get them because, you know, they all up in rocks and stuff. And who gave them that? God gave them that wisdom to do that. And then you got locusts. The locusts, they work together in order to survive. And they ain't even got a king. They ain't even got a designated leader. But somehow, some way, they stay together and they work together. Now, how did that happen? God, God gave them that wisdom. And then you think about the spider uh, shows up in a king's palace. Now, think about it. A spider is a little bit of something, but they know that the king have big parties and they lay traps for flies because, see, uh, food and stuff, it's going to attract flies. And so the uh, spider say, let's go on over here to this king house because this king, they ain't never running short on food and stuff and, and flies come in there. 
As a result, he just set his trap and he wait on the fly to, to be flying and then he get in the trap. And so then the spider just crawl on out and say, that's my lunch here. And now who gave him the sense to build his trap in a king palace? God did. <laughs> God did that. That's an amazing thing, ladies and gentlemen. How did these little things get so wise? It's God. Look, look what the Bible says. I like this over here in Proverbs 6, 6 through 11. It says, go to the ant, thou slugger. Consider her ways and be wise, which has no guide, overseer, or ruler. Provide her meat in the summer and gather her food in the harvest. How long will thou sleep, O sluggard? When will thou arise out of thy sleep? Yet a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to sleep, so shall thy poverty come as one that travail, and they thy want as an armed man. Notice God makes a comparison between a lazy man and the ant. He used an ant. He says, man, what you need to do, he says, the reason you ain't got nothing, the reason you living in the poor house is because you lazy. He said, what you need to go do, lazy man, is go and study the ant. Watch the ant. He said how the ant working hard in the summertime. He works hard in the summertime that he can have some food and stuff in the winter time and hard time. And he said, the reason you ain't got nothing even in the summertime is because you ain't working. You gotta go work. That's what he's saying. That's what he's saying. But who gave the ant that kind of wisdom? God did. And so uh, if, if we wanna be wise, then go look at the ant who got wisdom. Yeah, and, and this is why some people are poor. Some people are poor because they don't have the wisdom of an ant. They won't go study that ant like God said. And when you study that ant, you will see rather than laying around the house and watching football and entertaining yourself, uh, go out there and work in good time that you'll have some in bad time. See, why ant don't complain in hard time, but humans do. Because ant prepares for the hard time. Yeah, the reason that a lot of time we complain in hard time is because we didn't do the right thing in good time. The ant, God gave him wisdom. But let's move on. Let's move on before time run out on us. God owns, number three, God owns, provides, God owns, provides, and run the animal kingdom. God owns, provides, and he runs the animal kingdom. Yeah. God showed David that he provided for the animal kingdom over in Psalms 145. That's one of my favorite Psalms, Psalm 145. Verse 15 and 16, the scripture says, the eyes of all wait upon thee, and thou giveth them their meat in due season. Thou open thine hand and satisfies the desire of every living thing. Did you see that verse? That's a powerful verse. The eyes of all wait upon thee. Notice the ant, the mouse, the cow, the horse, the donkey, everything, eyes is waiting on God to feed them. Yeah, yeah. And then it says, thou open thine hand and satisfy the desire of every living thing. You know, my uh, professor in Bible college, uh, when he would start class each day, 
He would start class thanking God even for the food that we had for our breakfast. He, he would all, and he, he, would, he would say this, God, you open your hands this morning and we have food. Thank you. But if you ever decide to shut your hand, we die. As long as you open your hands, we live. But if you shut your hands, we die. So we thank you again for opening your hands on this day. That's how he would pray. Oh, boy. I never forgot that. I said, man, ain't that something? If God... The only reason we have something today, ladies and gentlemen, is because God opened his hand. If you had breakfast this morning, that's because God opened his hand. If you had dinner tonight, that's because God opened his hands. And you think about it. If God ever decides to shed his hands up, all of us would die. So thank God. Thank God. I don't care how um, little you got. Thank him. Thank him. Yeah. God showed Job that he owned and he runs the whole animal kingdom over in Job 38. Uh, oh, I wish we had time. Read chapter 38 and chapter 39. I'm going to just highlight it. Uh, uh, you know, Job kind of got upset with God because, you know, Job lost all his wealth. He lost all his health. And he lost everything. And then God just showed up in Job's life and started asking him some signs, questions <laughs> about the animal kingdom. Uh, uh, he says, Job, do you know how to take care of the lions? Over in uh, Job's 38, uh, chapter 38, verse number 39 and 40. Then he moves, says, what about the ravens in verse 41? Then he goes to chapter 39 and he said what about the wild goats do you know how to uh how you know the wild goat have uh uh little goats and stuff and then he goes on and in verse five and six or uh, five through eight of chapter uh, 39 or uh, what about the donkeys the wild donkeys can you uh, tell me about the wild donkeys and then he says what about the wild unicorn or the wild oxen and 9 through 11. Then he asked Job, uh, 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 did you give the beautiful wings to, uh, to the peacock? Tell me, tell me, tell me how, to, uh, you know, that peacock got them pretty wings like that, them pretty feathers. And, and what about the feathers of the ostrich? Tell me, tell me how they made and stuff. Verses 13 through 17. And uh, uh, as a matter of fact, uh, let's read verses 30, 13 through 17 of Job 39. Uh, notice what he says here. Gave it thou the goodly wings unto the peacock, of the wings and the feathers of the ostrich, which leaveth her eggs in the earth and warm them in the dust, and forget it that the foot may crush them, or that the wild beast may break them. Uh, she is hardened against her young ones as though they was not hers. He labor, uh, her labor is in vain without fear because God has deprived her of wisdom. Neither has he imparted to her understanding. Now, he said this, this ostrich, she'll have some, she lays her eggs and she hide them in the dust. In other words, Lord have mercy. In other words, she just lay them there on the ground. <laughs> she lay them there. She lay them there on the ground. Bless the lit ostrich heart. And then when she have the lit ostrich, she treat them like a bad stepchild. <laughs> and uh, uh, like you know that that they done something wrong and uh, she mean to them. And it's like she had them, uh, her children in vain. <laughs> That's what God said. He, he said the reason she acts so crazy is because, and, and matter of fact, she got them big old feet. And because 
you know, she ain't looking at what she going, you know, she just walking. She steps a lot of time on her own eggs <laughs> and crusts her eggs right after she done been setting on them, warming them and what have you. Uh, she can get right up and crush her own eggs. So her, her, her work is even in vain. But the reason she act like that, God says, I didn't give her no wisdom. I didn't give her no wisdom. And so and he says, I didn't give her wisdom. I didn't give her understanding. And so you see that when God don't give us wisdom and understanding, ladies and gentlemen, we'll turn on our own children. Yeah, yeah. That, that, that's, as a matter of fact, uh, uh, this will make a good Mother's Day sermon on how not to be a mama. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, I'm not going to preach that. I won't preach that. Uh, but notice uh, God questioned Job even about the horse. In uh, chapter 39, verses 19 to 22, he says, Has thou given the horse strength? Uh, uh, has thou clothed uh, his neck with thunder? Can thou make him afraid as a grasshopper? The glory of his nostrils is terrible. He paused in the valley and rejoiced in his strength. He goes on to meet the armed men. He mock at fear and is not dismayed. Neither turn he back from the sword. It's somebody, you know, a horse. A person uh, can be riding a horse here and a person can be riding a horse here. Two armies and they say charge and them horses is running straight towards each other in battle, and neither one of them blank an eye. He says, how did that happen? God gave that to the horse. Yeah, he gave that kind of courage to the horse. Then God talked to Job about the Leviathan or the uh, sea monster. We would call it the sea monster or the dragons. People talk about, do the Bible talk about the dragon? Yeah. And uh, Psalm um, and uh, Job 41, and they, uh, the sea monster, God questioned Job about the sea monster. And Job 41, he asked Job, can you capture him in verses 1 and 2? Or will you make him your servant in verse number 4? Uh, or will you try to make him your pet? Uh, can, you, can, you, can you go catch him and then make him your pet? Verse five through six. And then it says, can you try to sell him in verse number uh, uh, six? And then it said, will you try and train him? Can you train him, Job? Can you? In other words, God is asking Job questions about mastering his creation. Who can master even the sea monster, the, the dragon? Who, who can master him? Notice God's conclusion. In, in, in 41, Job 41 and 10, none is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before me? Notice he basically asks in Job, Job, if you can't handle the sea monster, the baddest thing out there in the sea, then what makes you think you can handle me, Job? Wow. That's powerful, ladies and gentlemen. And so he said, Job, if you can't manage an animal, then what make you think you can tangle with God? You, you, you don't know enough, Job. That's basically what he's saying. And, and even today, I, I believe now, a lot of these questions that God was asking Job, uh, a lot of scientists today, even, you know, uh, uh, a 10th grade uh, a uh, science student can answer a lot of these questions about, you know, how donkey have babies and what have you. But I think today God would ask some questions today that ain't even in the science book <laughs> that man hadn't even thought about. And so uh, the point is, uh, if well, let's uh, let's uh, let's just go on. Uh, the point is that God, he owns everything, he provides for everything, and he runs everything on his planet. Now, let's, let's, let's go on. I got just enough time to bring this to a conclusion, get my fourth point in. God controls 
God controls. God controls, God controls the animal kingdom. God controls the animal kingdom. See, everything God makes, God can control it. You see that in the story of Noah, uh, the wolves. Notice, God put all these creatures on board of the, the boat, but a lot of these creatures, they was enemies of one another. Uh, like the wolf and the lamb and the leopards and the goats and the cow and the lion. And now you think about it. Uh, how did that happen that the lion and the cow can stay together? The leopards and the goats can stay together and the wolves and the lamb can stay together. Uh, how did that happen? Did God put them to sleep while they was on the boat? Did, did, did God say, now, uh, I'm going to uh, just like the bear hibernate all went along, sleep all went. I'm going to put all y'all to sleep. All y'all going to hibernate while y'all for a whole year while y'all on this boat. Y'all going to hibernate. Or did God change the nature? of those animals because that's what he's going to do uh, in the kingdom. In the kingdom, you know, when Jesus come back and reign here on this earth in the kingdom for that whole thousand years, the wolf, the Bible says in Isaiah chapter 11, verse 6, the wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leper shall lie down with the goat. The calf, uh, the cow, and the young lamb, and the fatling together, and a child shall lead them. So you don't have to worry about animals attacking animals in the kingdom because God is going to change their nature. Yeah. And so that's what we see here. So I don't know if God changed their nature or did God put them to sleep uh, while they was on board. I think he probably put them to sleep for the simple reason that, Everything came on there two by two. You know, he had two of this and two of that, a male and a female, and a male and a female. And the same number that they had when they got on board of the ship was the same number that they had when they got off the ship. So in other words, it wasn't no mating going on, no breathing going on on there. So I think he must have put them to sleep. Yeah. Uh, let's go on a little bit further. Then you got the story of Daniel, the story of Daniel in the lounge den. That was another miracle. Uh, Daniel says in chapter six, verse number 22, when they had put him there, that the king asked, oh, Daniel, uh, did your God protect you there in the, in the lounge den? Daniel said, my God had sent his angels and had shut up the lounge mouth that they may not hurt me. Uh, how did the angels shut up the lion's mouth? Uh, because they still had claws. God somehow controlled those lions. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So uh, I think he was using that uh, as a metaphor too. He done just shut up the lion's mouth. He stopped the lion. That's what he was basically saying. It wasn't just he had shut up the, because you can shut up a person uh, uh, mouth, but they still can fight you and stuff. And the lion still could have, you know, clawed him to death. But I think uh, God was more or less saying uh, he stopped the lions. He stopped the lion. Then the story of Paul in uh, getting snake bit. You see how God controls uh, his crawling creatures. Uh, Acts 28, verse number three through five and six. And when Paul had gathered a bundle of sticks, laid them on the fire, there came out a viper, a viper, ladies and gentlemen, out of the heat and fastened it on his hands. And when he had shook off the beast into the fire, there felt no harm. How be it they looked when he uh, should have swollen or fallen down dead suddenly. But after they had looked a great while and saw no harm come to him, they changed their mind and said that he was a god. They said, man, this guy should have been dead. He should have done fell over dead. He done got bit by a viper, a very, very poisonous snake. 
Who make the snake? God. Who control the parts? God. And so God controlled the part. Remember what God told the disciples over in Mark 16, verse number 18. They shall take up serpents, and if they drink any deadly thing, it should not hurt them. Why is that called God control it? God control it. And then finally, the last miracle was the story of Jesus riding on the back of a young donkey, a coat of a donkey. Uh, the Bible says in Mark chapter 11, verse number two, and said unto them, go ye uh, your way into the village over against you. And as soon as ye be entered into it, you shall find a coat tied where up and never a man set. Never a man set. Let me say that again. Never a man set. Loose him and bring him. And notice, Jesus sat on a donkey that ain't never been rolled before. Listen, listen. If you sat on an animal and ain't never been rolled before, then that animal's going to throw you. And particularly, think about it. That was Palm Sunday. They was waving their hands, um, throwing stuff all on the ground, putting palm leaves, uh, putting their clothes and stuff, throwing stuff before an animal, and Jesus just rolled right on, rolled right. He controlled the animal. That showed that he's con he controlled the donkey. So we see that God controls the animal kingdom. So what have we learned this evening? We've, we've learned who made the animals? God. Everything has a purpose. We learned that. Number three, God owns, he provides, and he runs the animal kingdom. And then number four, God controls the animal kingdoms. He controlled the animal kingdom. So what can we learn from this lesson? Number one, believe that God created Believe that God created, God created, God created the animal kingdom. Believe that God created the animal kingdom. And then number two, believe that God owns and provides for the animal kingdom. Believe that God owns and God provides, uh, provides for the animal kingdom. And then number three, trust God. Trust God to provide for you. Trust God to provide for you. Listen, if God can provide for sea monsters. Don't you think God can provide for you? If God can provide for donkeys and oxen, don't you think that you more important than a donkey and an ox? If God can do that for them, then I know without a shadow of doubt that God can do it for you. That's why Paul said, and my God shall supply all my needs according to his riches and glory. Say that with me. My God shall supply all my needs according to his riches in glory in Christ Jesus. As the songwriter say, I love God. You don't love God. What's wrong with you? I love God. You don't love God. What's wrong with you? Listen. Nothing wrong with you if you love God. But if you don't love God then that's when something is wrong with you. So don't let nobody make you think that something's wrong with you because you love God. No, no. 
you right on the money. You love God. God love you. And ain't nothing wrong with you. God bless you. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this lesson. Take this lesson and use it to bring honor and glory to your name. Lord, bless your people with the blessing they stand in need of, whether it's something physical, spiritual, financial, and we'll be careful to praise you for it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. God bless you. Have a good night. Now stay encouraged. I say stay encouraged, and we'll see you on Sunday.